With the introduction of legal cannabis, we've seen the rise in a new class of criminal. By making local officials the gatekeepers for million dollar businesses, states have created a breeding ground for bribery, extortion, and favoritism. What's good y'all, this is LMC. In this video, we are going to be diving into the rise of white collar crime and the proliferation of corruption throughout the United States when it comes to cannabis. When people try to legalize marijuana, there's typically a demand that local communities be given a say in whether a dispensary will be set up shop in their towns. While great in theory, these practices effectively put million dollar decisions in the hands of relatively small time political figures, and some big, and depending on how you take it. But these people can include the mayors, the councilors of small towns and cities, and more. But before we get into the rest of this video, I wanna say a big thank you to the sponsor of this video, that being the WeedTube. If you're not aware of the WeedTube, well, it's a platform created by cannabis creators like myself that were sick and tired of having their accounts deleted and so they created their own platform so this video that you're watching right now was actually available about a month ago so if you want early access to some of my content then go over to my weedtube channel that's lmc.luke and go subscribe anyways big thank you to the folks over at the weedtube it's truly the only platform that is 100% safe for content creators like myself. So make sure to go subscribe to my YouTube channel and go check out other content creators on the platform. Anyways, let's jump back into the video. Back in 2016, Massachusetts passed a recreational cannabis initiative and gave jurisdiction to local authorities. Not only are cannabis companies required to have a letter of support from municipalities to get a state license, they must also have a, quote, host community agreement, which allows for a community impact fee of not more than 3% of gross sales of the cannabis business, but that also varies. Local control is the biggest mistake that we made, said Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commissioner at the time, Shalene Title. I'm a big fan of Shalene Title, by the way. She's done some amazing work. The competition for licenses has been so intense that companies quickly found ways of going beyond the 3% cap, offering more to communities in order to win their support. In this scramble for licenses, large multi-state operators were able to offer cities much greater financial benefits compared to small, locally run businesses. Exactly the opposite of what the law intended. Most states wanted to limit the number of licenses or licensed vendors and give local governments control of where to locate dispensaries. They created something else, a market for local corruption. If the prohibition of cannabis shows us anything, a market demand will always be filled. Now, for our first example of corruption, we, st we start with Yasiel Correa, he's 23 years old at the time, and he was elected mayor of Fall River, which is a small town in Massachusetts. As mayor, he was solely responsible for approving all non-opposition letters in Fall River. He would meet with cannabis entrepreneurs and cigar bars to see how willing they were to pay him bribes. In Fall River, with its population of roughly 90,000, the cost of obtaining a letter of local approval from Correa's city hall was anywhere from $100,000 to $250,000 in bribes, according to the indictment. One business even agreed to give 2% of his sales to a friend of Correa's who was helping to facilitate the bribes. In the end, four cannabis vendors agreed to pay Correa and his co-conspirators in return for non-opposition letters and host community agreements literally paying for a chance to contribute to the community. Korea and his co-conspirators, staffers, and friends accepted a variety of bribes, including cash, more than a dozen pounds of cannabis, and a quote-unquote Batman Rolex watch that was worth up to $12,000, according to the indictment. Just before his re-election race, FBI agents raided his home 
led him away from his home in handcuffs and charged him attempting to extort cannabis companies of $600,000 in exchange for granting them lucrative licenses to sell cannabis. He is currently being held at the Federal Correctional Institution in Berlin, New Hampshire. But if you don't believe me, check this out. This noon time. Breaking news to report as embattled Fall River Mayor Jaisal Correa is arrested again. Correa has been charged with extorting vendors for legal marijuana shops. He was led away in handcuffs this morning as an Eyewitness News viewer recorded video. The arrest at the mayor's home. Target 12 investigators first breaking the story this morning at WPRI.com. We have also learned this noontime that four other people are also facing charges and the accusations are shaking up the political scene. Eyewitness News has team coverage from Fall River to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston. We will go live to the city in a moment with Alexander Leslie. First, though, the federal indictment details with Julianne Lima in Boston. Well, that's right, Danielle. Absolutely stunning allegations this morning. The FBI just wrapped up a press conference moments ago. They say Mayor Jaisal Correa ran the city of Fall River as a, quote, paid-to-play institution. They're now charging him with extortion, bribery, wire fraud, and more. Correa is accused of conspiring to extort hundreds of thousands of dollars in bribes from at least four marijuana companies. As mayor, Correa was in charge of issuing non-opposition letters that give pot shops permission to open in the city. He's accused of shaking down marijuana business owners to pay him off in exchange for those letters. According to the indictment, Correa used middlemen to accept bribe payments of cash and marijuana. In one instance, investigators say Correa was handed $75,000 cash in the back of a car in exchange for one of those letters. Prosecutors say some of the bribes were paid in up to 15 pounds of marijuana. Four others, including Correa's chief of staff, are also facing charges. If the allegations in today's indictment are true, Mayor Correa has engaged in an outrageous, brazen campaign of corruption, which turned his job into a personal ATM. Despite Mayor Correa's public assurances to the city of Fall River, based on today's indictment, he has essentially run that town as a pay-to-play institution. Now, many of these allegations took place after Correa's first arrest last fall. His fraud case is set to go to trial in February. Meanwhile, he's set to face a judge in federal court today around 2.30 this afternoon, so stay with us for the very latest. Reporting live in Boston, I'm Julianne Lima, Eyewitness News. And our breaking news coverage continues of Fall River Mayor Jason Correa being arrested by these federal agents. The city of Fall River, as you might imagine, is reacting to all of these new allegations. We're hearing from some neighbors and I'm going to see reporter Alexander Leslie joins us live in Fall River with more. Well, neighbors tell me where I'm standing right now was blocked with unmarked law enforcement cars earlier this morning. This is his home behind me. We were able to get a look at what the mayor's arrest looked like as it unfolded. Neighbors tell me they saw Correa get put in a car in handcuffs around 8 this morning. They add that arrest was quick and quiet. Now, later this morning, I did try knocking on the front door of Mayor Correa's home but no one answered. Now, following the arrest, I did find some other neighbors who learned of the news, and I asked if this now second arrest of the mayor would make an impact on the upcoming election. I got some mixed reviews. Some people said they didn't believe the arrest, while other people told me they thought that they would give him a second chance, and now they're not going to try again when he is up for election this coming fall. Now, this arrest comes less than a day after a mayoral debate last night. Keep in mind that election is Keep in mind that election is coming up in less than two weeks. Live in Fall River, I'm Alexander Leslie, Eyewitness News. The judge is allowing him to surrender to federal prison at a later date. So he's going to have to wait to learn when that is. And he's also going to have to wait to learn the ruling on restitution in this case. Jason Correa, the former mayor of Fall River, leaves federal court this afternoon, now knowing he will likely spend more time in prison than he did in the mayor's office. Judge Douglas Woodlock today sentenced Correa to 72 months, six years of incarceration. The penalty that he's facing, going to federal prison, that's going to happen. It's probably going to happen in the next eight or so weeks. 
The judge all but indicated that he is not going to grant a stay of execution of the sentence. So by the time Thanksgiving rolls around, there's a pretty good expectation that Jaseel Correa will be in federal prison somewhere. A jury convicted Correa in May of wire fraud, filing false tax returns and extortion charges for defrauding investors in his company and demanding bribes from marijuana companies that wanted to do business in Fall River. Yesterday, Judge Woodlock indicated that he would likely overturn eight of the 21 counts Correa was convicted on. But that seems to have had little impact on the sentence, which the judge handed down after delivering a scathing rebuke, saying Correa showed, quote, an absolute lack of remorse. The judge asked rhetorically, if we can't trust each other, if we can't trust our government, where are we? Would you like to make a statement? Correa declined to address the court or the media based on the advice of his legal team. Late this afternoon, the acting U.S. attorney for Massachusetts wrote this reaction. Jason Correa was a corrupt and deceitful politician who could only be stopped by federal prosecution. Now he is a felon and will be a federal inmate. And the defense team has already started working on an appeal tonight. It is unclear if prosecutors will seek to have those overturned counts reinstated. Reporting live at Federal Court in South Boston, Todd Kiskevich, WCVB News Center 5. Todd, thank you. We have been following the trouble for Mayor Correa for a while, back to October of 2018 to be exact. That's when he was first arrested on federal charges, including wire and tax fraud. That led to a vote of no confidence by city council members that November. Correa was asked to resign. When he refused to resign, that resulted in a recall election in March of 2019. The embattled mayor survived. He stayed in office. But by September of 2019, he was facing more charges, accused of conspiring to extort hundreds of thousands of dollars in bribes from marijuana companies. And this May, he was convicted of 21 of 24 federal corruption charges against him. Some of those charges dropped yesterday. Now he has been sentenced to six years, but as Todd just said, his sentence could be delayed pending appeal. The FBI has been warning states across the country about the public corruption threat posed by the marijuana industry. Quote, we've seen it in some states the price go as high as $500,000 for a license to sell marijuana. So we see people willing to pay large amounts of money to get into the industry, said one special agent, that being Regino Chavez last year. Now the price for $500,000, it can range. It can actually go even higher than that. It just depends which state you're in. But it's not just local officials. Allegations of corruption have reached the state level in numerous marijuana programs. While in office, Cheryl Glenn, a Democrat, served as chair of the Baltimore City Delegation and sponsored the bill that created Maryland's medical marijuana program. The program was named for Glenn's mother, Natalie M. LaPride, who died of kidney cancer and could not access the drug to ease her symptoms, or more so, the plant to ease her, ease her symptoms. The former Maryland State Delegate Cheryl Glenn was sentenced to two years in prison in July of 2020 for accepting money in exchange for her support on measures that included preferential treatment for Maryland-based cannabis companies and expanded licensing out out-of-state marijuana companies quote she chose to monetize the position she assumed assistant assistant u.s attorney leo j wise said quote without exaggerating delegate glenn sold her vote on a bill that literally had her mother's name on it now if you don't believe me check this out former state delegate cheryl glenn was before a federal judge today on charges of bribery and wire fraud. WMAR 2 News' Brian Kubler was in court and has details on her plea. Cheryl Glenn walked into this courthouse, a former state delegate, and walked out a convicted felon. She pleaded guilty to both counts against her. The District 45 representative was scheduled for her arraignment today after her indictment was unsealed just before Christmas. The federal government says she took almost $34,000 in bribes to get certain legislation passed around medical marijuana and liquor licenses. The former delegate pleaded guilty to all of it today and faces up to 25 years in federal prison. Ms. Glenn, do you have any comment, Ms. Glenn? No comment. Thank you. As you can see there, Glenn had nothing to say as she walked out of court today. Neither did her attorney. She had to forfeit her passport today. The sentencing in this case will be May 8th. Medical marijuana programs in more conservative states such as Arkansas and Missouri have also been hit with allegations of corruption, though none of those have stuck in court.
In both states, applicants who lost out on licenses believe the supposed merit-based application process was rigged to benefit the politically well-connected. We'll never necessarily know on those, but yeah. Now, Florida has one of the largest medical marijuana markets in the entire country, with almost 600,000 plus registered medical marijuana patients. Now, the company, Trulieve, well, check this out. ...out licenses to the first group of medical marijuana growers in state history. But that announcement was quickly followed by 21 protests from companies that question how those proposals were scored. While the protest continues, senior IT reporter Dale Russell did his own investigation, finding one winning company's ties to a public corruption case in nearby Florida. Real estate developer J.T. Burnett leaves federal court in Florida just days before a jury convicted him on public corruption charges. Next to him, his wife, Kim Rivers, the CEO of the medical marijuana company, True Leaf Cannabis Corporation. I'm glad we've arrived at this, as Danielle says, historic moment. The Florida public corruption case began just 12 days before the Georgia Access to Medical Cannabis Commission awarded Truly one of Georgia's first ever licenses to grow medical marijuana. Kim Rivers was seen at her husband's side throughout the trial after weeks of testimony last Friday, a verdict as reported by WCTV. As businessman JT Burnett is found guilty on a handful of charges. The key evidence in the federal case was recordings made by undercover FBI agents. The U.S. Attorney's Office alleged J.T. Burnett made payments to a county official to help kill a development deal by a competitor. The I-Team has obtained copies of transcripts of those undercover tapes, and in them, J.T. Burnett speaks openly about how he and his now wife, Kim Rivers, CEO of True Leaf, worked together to obtain one of the first medical marijuana licenses in Florida for True Leaf. In one transcript, Burnett described his now wife to undercover FBI agents as one of the most powerful political people out there. And if you're with the wrong side of Kim Rivers, it's like punching somebody in the It's like punching a gorilla. She's uh, ruthless as a, as a business owner, and sometimes you have to be that. But I think Joshua Luttrell is CEO of Veterans for Cannabis, a longtime advocate for medical marijuana, and now a member of a group that failed to win a license in Georgia and has filed a protest. JT Burnett told undercover agents about how years ago he and his now wife saw the value in obtaining a medical marijuana license in Florida. We didn't know how to grow marijuana, he told the undercover FBI agent. All we knew is that five licensed marijuana in Florida real valuable. We didn't have to know anything more than that. They didn't know anything about it, uh, but they knew they had to be a part of it. Burnett later told undercover agents when Florida legislators created the new medical marijuana law, he and a former Florida state legislator made little tweaks that give you some advantage to the marijuana legislation. There's a track record. Um, they've done it in other states. We have to make sure that it did not happen. True Leave now operates in six states. Burnett is not listed as an officer on True Leave's SEC filings, but on their state application, he is listed as co owner of a construction company that True Leave paid more than $100 million to during 2019 and most of 2020. You know, if they're using a vendor that now has a, a conviction for a federal crime, that should be a huge issue and should be a, a, an automatic disqualifier. True Leaves medical marijuana application in January, which is heavily redacted, warned of an ongoing investigation in Florida related to alleged corruption by local officials, but it did not mention J.T. Burnett's public corruption trial. True Leaf wrote to say the Georgia application did not mention Burnett because he's not a part of our corporation and has no role in True Leaf Georgia operations. The Georgia Cannabis Commission selected True Leaf for one of the two large production licenses right before True Leaf's CEO's husband was found guilty. They have the ability to recall that and not issue that license out um, based on additional information that's come up after the application process is closed. So, you know what? They should. 
Truly wrote to say that neither they nor their CEO were a part of the Florida case. They said it would be inappropriate to comment because it has nothing to do with them. We reached out to the Georgia Cannabis Commission and didn't hear back from anyone. Dale Russell, Fox 5 News. Do you want more stories of cannabis corruption? Because trust me, I could keep going on and on and on and on. There's so many corruption scandals when it comes to cannabis in the U.S. It's absolutely insane. In conclusion, the cannabis industry is extremely vulnerable against corruption as we've seen. I merely highlighted three different examples, but like I said, there is hundreds of these examples. Even with industries like alcohol or gambling, policymakers have been working on regulating those industries for decades. But in the cannabis space, we're almost literally making it up as we go. No history, no background, no norms. States that have largely avoided corruption controversies either do not have license caps like Oklahoma or New Mexico. And many entrepreneurs, particularly those who lost out on license applications, believe the government shouldn't be in the business of picking winners and losers and should just let the free market do its job. We see a lot of this happening. For example, a lot of companies getting destroyed by the government. Usually these companies are small businesses. And what we're seeing really is certain businesses utilizing the government to destroy or to not even allow their competition to come into business or even compete. Crony capitalism, no competition. And it's really, really unfair. Anyways, I hope this video helps shine a light on how, in many ways, the legalization of cannabis on the state level has created the perfect breeding grounds for cannabis corruption. If I had to make some suggestions, I would say that we need to prevent, you know, one, two, or three people from deciding who gets licenses, but rather democratize that process a bit more by adding more people to the decision-making process. Really, there's a lot more that could be done. That's just one example, it's one suggestion. But the fact is, in America, corporations have taken over. And corporations, big business, they don't play by the rules. Oh, no, actually they do. Except they're the ones that write the rules. They're the ones that influence the politicians. They legally bribe the politicians. And obviously in the case for cannabis, there's a lot of times it's illegal, but in general, broader sense, we see a lot of corporations legally bribe these politicians and it's legal. Now, cannabis, like I said, is a different issue, but hey, that's a product of what we're in. America huh, is ran by corporations, is ran by big business. Anyways, this is LMC signing out.